Hello everybody. In this video we're going to be covering section 4.1 in our textbook. Uh, it's got two big ideas for us. We're going to learn how to derive chemical equations from narrative descriptions and we're going to write and balance chemical equations and we're going to learn how to do that in both molecular, total ionic, and net ionic formats. So, so far we've learned how to write elemental symbols and we can represent individual atoms, molecules, and compounds. So we can represent different chemical species, but we don't have any way of representing yet a chemical reaction, the change that occurs for these different chemical species. To do that, we're going to need uh, chemical equations. Um, and I have a little definition here. A balanced chemical equation uses symbolism to represent both the identities and relative quantities of substances undergoing a chemical or physical change. <clears throat> so a little bit of the language that is around chemical equations. Um, substances that are on the left that are going to undergo a chemical reaction are called the reactants. The substances on the right uh, that are the products are called the products. A plus sign separates the individual reactant and product formulas. And an arrow separates the left and the right side. So all of our reactants will be to the left of an arrow. All of our products will be to the right of an arrow. Um, the relative numbers of reactant and product species are represented by coefficients. And what these are are numbers that we placed immediately to the left of each formula. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about what the coefficients are. <coughs> But uh, an important rule of thumb to keep in mind is that a coefficient of 1 is typically omitted. Um, and the reverse of that logic is that when you don't see a coefficient, you should assume that it is 1. So if we have our model reaction here, we have methane. Okay, so I have a carbon atom. Four hydrogen atoms are on it. I have plus O2. The 2 here indicates that each one of these molecules has two oxygens. The two here, the coefficient, means that I have two of those molecules. Uh, they're going to react together. This would be like the burning you would see in your furnace. And they're going to produce CO2, one carbon, two oxygens, plus two water molecules. <coughs> now it's important to note that this is the smallest ratios that these can be found in. All right, And this can always be scaled up. For instance, I could multiply both sides by 3, essentially, and I would have 3 methanes, 6 oxygens, and I would produce 3 CO2s, and 6 water molecules. So we can always scale it up. Therefore, what we're really representing here is the smallest whole number ratios at which this reaction is going to take place. <coughs> and that means that we need to always reflect that in our uh, reactions. Okay, so coefficients should be the smallest possible whole values. That means that writing a reaction like this would be good, whereas if I multiplied each of these by 2, that would be wrong. Um, the reverse of that logic being, if you can divide evenly a number into all of the coefficients, you should do that to get the uh, smallest whole number ratios. Um, these coefficients represent the ratio of reactants and products, all right? and they can be used to find the number of each type of atom. For instance, let's say that I wanted to know how many uh, oxygen atoms were on the reactant side and how many oxygen atoms were on the product side. I have two O2s here. There are, uh, so I tend to take that coefficient, two O2. There are two oxygen atoms for every one O2. I cancel that and I see that I have four oxygens on this side. On the product side, I have one CO2 and two H2Os. They both have oxygen in them. So there's two oxygen atoms for every one CO2. So this guy contributes two oxygen atoms. And there are two uh, H2Os, each contributing an oxygen atom. So two times one is another two. 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 oxygen atoms. Now, if I did it for all of the elements, I would see that this is what we call balanced, meaning that we have the same number of elements on the left-hand side as we do on the right-hand side. We have one carbon on either side, we have four hydrogens on either side, and we have four oxygens on either side. 
And balancing reactions is really, really important, actually. Uh, an example from your textbook is uh, rockets. So there is oxygen and fuel in there that needs to be carefully balanced. Um, if it's not, uh, bad stuff is going to happen where it's either going to wind up exploding or it's just going to run out of propulsion before it gets all the way up into orbit and then fall back to Earth. So how do we go about balancing a reaction um, when, we, when we're not given a balanced reaction to start off with? Right? Uh, to achieve balance, the coefficients of the equation must be changed as needed. All right? um, we do not change the subscripts. Okay? The subscripts define the identity of the substance, and uh, so they cannot be changed without altering the qualitative meaning of the equation. That means that if I was given an unbalanced equation like this, I could change the coefficients to make it balance on either side, but I couldn't just change the subscripts to make them balance. Okay, I'm changing what uh, type of molecule I have here and here. Um, so how do we go about balancing? Um, the easiest way is actually by inspection. Um, there are some numerical methods for doing it, but they're pretty uh, kind of gross and hard, and you probably wouldn't want to do that. Really, it's, it's easier to think of them kind of like a puzzle, like a Sudoku or something like that. Uh, so in this case, we have H2O goes to hydrogen plus oxygen molecules. Um, and we're going to start by counting up the number of each element on either side. So we have two H2s on the reactant side. We have two H2s on the product side. And that's good. Now we're balanced. So we're, our hydrogen is balanced in this case. Um, we have one oxygen on this side. And we have two oxygens on that side. So our oxygen isn't balanced. Now, we can only uh, change the coefficients. So in general, you're kind of stuck uh, increasing one side as opposed, as opposed to decreasing another side. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to need to uh, put it, change this coefficient so that that's going to be a 2. So we multiply this by 2 and we go back through and we do our count again. Now we have 2 times 2, 4 hydrogen on that side and we have 2, 1 times 2, 2 hydrogen on that side We've got 2 times 1, 2 oxygens on that side, and 1 times 2, 2 oxygens on that side. So we managed to balance our oxygens, but we unbalanced our hydrogens in doing so. But that's okay, um, because we can actually change the number of hydrogens on this side by manipulating just this one coefficient here, because it only includes hydrogen. All right. All we need to do is just increase this guy until uh, it is a 4. So we can put a 2 in front of that. And we wind up with a balanced equation where we now have an equal number of hydrogens and oxygens on each side. Um, these can be a little tricky. So sometimes you just kind of uh, need to play with it a little bit and get a little practice at doing some of them. And there's quite a few examples in the homework for you guys to, to, to look over. One trick is that sometimes when you go through and you're balancing, um, you get to one of the coefficients and you say, boy, if that coefficient could just be seven halves, well, then all of a sudden everything would balance out and everything would be perfect, right? Because I need to have seven halves times two, seven oxygens on this side. So what you do is you just go through and you do make it seven halves, all right? And then... You use the fact that we can scale this up like we've seen before and you multiply each one of the coefficients by some value to clear that fraction. All right. So in this case, I would just multiply by this 2 and I would get a reaction that looks like this. So I did 1 times 2, 7 halves times 2, 3 times 2, 2 times 2, and then I wind up with a balanced uh, reaction. Okay. So you don't want multiple uh, fractions in here, but if you find that like that last one that's kind of tricky to balance, you could put a fraction in there. 
go ahead and do it and then just figure out what you have to multiply by to get it to all work out. So, um, so far we've been writing our reactions without this additional bit of information and that's actually pretty naughty. Um, you should always write the additional bits of information into the uh, reaction. Um, the biggest one is indicating the state of each one of the chemical species. All right. So if it's a gas, you put this, you put a parenthesis and you put a G in there. If it's a liquid, it's L. If it's a solid, it's S. If it's aqueous, meaning it's dissolved in water, you put AQ. And, and these are going to be your big states that you're going to have to uh, include. Um, some special conditions can also be included, uh, and they're usually designated either above or below the arrow here. For instance, this little delta right here means that you heated it. So you took the calcium carbonate and you heated it to get it to become calcium oxide and uh, CO2. Um, a little extra note here is that these are actually italics. So if you are... Um, writing typing them out you should italicize these here uh, so let's talk a little bit about ionic equations because we have three different types of ionic equations where we're just being a little bit more specific about what we mean when we have these ions in uh, aqueous solutions all right um, the first one would be your molecular equation and this is pretty much what you would expect. All right, I'm saying that I had I put I had a uh, some container of water. I put calcium chloride in it. I put silver nitrate in it. I got calcium not nitrate out, and that was dissolved. So both of these dissolved. This stayed dissolved, and then this silver chloride here came out as a solid. All right, so you can see why having these states here gives me the extra bit of information that I need to see what exactly happened here. All right, I formed a solid of silver chloride. Um, but this doesn't explicitly represent the fact that this is not the molecule that actually exists in the water anymore. In fact, what happens is when you take these ionic species and you place them into water, they are going to dissociate and form ions in those solutions. Okay, so calcium chloride is going to break up into a calcium ion and two chloride ions. Silver nitrate is going to break up to two silver uh, ions and two nitrate ions. Calcium nitrate is going to break up into calcium and two nitrate ions. All right. Um, because the silver chloride was indicated to be a solid back here, that's indicating that it did not dissociate. It did not dissolve in the water. All right, so it did not form ions. Now what I can do is I can basically take this equation here and substitute in for each one of these their ions. And when I do that, I get what we call the complete ionic equation. All right. Now I'm explicitly representing all of the ions that are in solution. I do it for all of the aqueous species. Um, notice that, for instance, the case where I had calcium chloride, this subscript is 2, and that becomes a coefficient over here because it produces two chloride ions. All right? This is one of the only cases where we're going to be mixing uh, the subscripts or the uh, in the coefficients all right just because in that case that subscript d does become the coefficient here and that this is the only time that really basically happens all right and now I'm explicitly writing out my complete ionic equation you see that these get really long so that's why I actually broke it and then I put this down here that's something that you can do if you're typing them out at some point um, but it's less than desirable we'll notice that what winds up happening now is that I have a calcium ion on this side and I have a calcium ion on this side I have these two nitrate ions on this side I have these two nitrate ions on this side and they don't change at all during the reaction all right and typically when we talk about chemical reactions we're interested in the things that did change 
So these species that are the same on both sides, they are what are known as spectator ions, okay? They're called spectator ions because they're spectators in this case. Pretty much anything is a, some spectator species is just one that didn't change during the reaction. And what I can do is I can actually just get rid of them because they didn't change. And then I get what is known as the net ionic reaction. Um, and this gives you a little bit better description about this, what actually happened during this reaction. We know that silver, uh, a silver ion came, found a chloride ion, and it formed a silver chloride solid. 